everyone. My name is Misha Sra, and I'm from the University of California at Santa Barbara. I'd like to welcome you all to session seven on haptics. Um, we have four conference papers today and one general paper in this session. I'm going to monitor Slido for questions that we're going to ask the speakers at the end of each talk. So please post your questions on Slido. Also, feel free to chat among yourselves on Slack, but ask questions on Slido. Um, with that, I would like to welcome our first speaker, David Engelmeyer, who's going to be presenting the paper, A Tangible Spherical Proxy for Object Manipulation in Augmented Reality. Hi, I'm David from LMU Munich, and on behalf of my co-authors, I would like to present our paper, A Tangible Spherical Proxy for Object Manipulation in Augmented Reality. As this title indicates, our basic idea was to use a sphere as a universal object for embodying any kind of virtual objects in AR while providing manipulation capabilities in not only translation and rotation, but also in scaling. On the left, we can see the spherical controller that we built can be easily held in one or two hands, while on the right, we see it overlaid with a virtual object that needs to be aligned with a corresponding target by just using the basic RTS, rotation, translation, and scaling operations. To generate the AR scene, we used the camera feed of the HTC Vive Pro. For this project, we had four main research goals in mind. At first, we needed to find a working implementation for the spherical AR controller. This is not really straightforward, since these kind of controllers are not commonly used in AR or VR. So we had to think of ways on how to model translation, rotation and scaling to a single handheld sphere. Second, we wanted to issue a comparison to state-of-the-art manipulation techniques in an alignment task, to gather data on how our approach would perform in comparison to already established methods. Third, we wanted to discover possible benefits coming from the spherical shape alone, but also from an object already known from the real world, such as the sphere certainty is. Last, we wanted to see if the sphere would have advantages when used in combination with a rigid surface, in our case a table as we can see on the image on the right. Our approach is based on the following fields of related work. We looked into handheld spherical devices in AR and VR, where we can for example find handheld perspective correct spherical displays that are implemented by projecting an image to the surface of a tracked sphere from the outside. We also find totally simulated handheld spherical displays in VR that incorporate capabilities that are not yet possible for real-world or AR approaches. For example, our own work that was presented at IEEE VR19. Then we looked into tangible AR in general, where object manipulation is on the one hand often done by embodying virtual objects, but also by using a manipulator that often by the shape indicates certain functionalities. For example, a shovel or a scoop that's used to pick up virtual objects. When we think of what functionalities a sphere could possibly indicate, rotation would be certainly among the first ideas. Then we looked into object manipulation techniques in AR and VR or desktop environments, where we basically can find different spherical devices that once are um, directly coupled to the manipulated object or allow manipulation from a distance. Lastly, because of the table condition, we also investigated surface-supported object manipulation. In this field also approaches exist that use spheres that are, for example, rolled or dragged on a surface. If we look at our construction, we try to keep it as simple and low cost as possible. We mounted a wife tracker to the inside of a two-piece acrylic glass sphere with a diameter of 12 centimeters. The tracker was held in place um, by a quarter inch threaded rod, um, screwed to a circular plate, and then the top half of the sphere pushing down on this construction. With this approach, we get a completely round surface, since all the mounting is done on the inside. It's also quite lightweight, um, with a total weight of 190 grams, and the tracker being the heaviest part of the construction. There are approaches that use um, two trackers on the inside, but we hardly encountered any tracking errors if we only used one. 
the two-piece design conveniently allows us to charge the tracker or exchange the tracker if needed, while the 12 cm diameter not only allows the device to be easily held in one hand, but also prevents the users from completely obstructing the tracking sensors. Since for the tracked object we only had six degrees of freedom available, we relied on a mode-based approach, with one mode for translation and rotation and one mode for scaling. But this the sphere can act as an embodiment in the move and rotate mode, while the modes in general can be selected with a menu that comes up when we initially touch the virtual object with the sphere, or when we have placed the object after keeping the sphere still for a second. The scaling, um, as we can see on the right side, works by rotation, as we show a horizontal axis going through the center of the sphere. If the sphere is rotated towards the user, the object size is increased, while an opposite rotation would decrease the scale. For our study, we recruited 30 participants with an average age of 22.3. They had to complete an alignment task once in mid-air and once on a table. We used a within subjects design, so all participants had to execute all four controller conditions, that I will explain in a second, in a counterbalanced order. The conditions were designed in a way that they would continuously increase hardware complexity by including a physical button and a touchpad. We mainly focused on task completion time and therefore created an AR environment that was set up so that users had to quickly grab an object, examine the object's structure, manipulate it and then place it at a predefined position. After the tasks were complete, we collected subjective ratings via a post-experiment questionnaire. For the first condition, the sphere, we have the previously outlined menu-based approach with one mode for translation and rotation and a second mode that allows for scaling when the sphere is rotated around the central axis. As we can see now in the video, we can touch the virtual object with the sphere and then select the move and rotate mode to place the object at the desired spot by holding it still for one second. With the scale mode, we then can bring it up to the desired target scale by just rotating the sphere. For the second condition, controller buttonless, we just exchanged the sphere with a VR controller, in particular the HTC Vive controller, and the interaction works just the same as in the first condition. Again, we can select the object by touching it with the controller, place it with the move and rotate mode, and then scale it up by now rotating a not rotational symmetric object around the central axis. For the third condition, controller button and menu, we added a physical button to the interaction, meaning that now in both modes a clutching technique could be applied, enabling one-handed interaction. Therefore, we also changed the scaling mode now to a distance-based approach. So in the video, we can now see that the controller can be easily operated with just one hand by holding and releasing the trigger. While for scaling, an increase in distance with a held trigger increases and the opposite action decreases the object scale. For the fourth condition, controller button and touchpad, we added a touchpad for scaling, meaning that all operations could be now executed simultaneously. It is worth to note that we considered this condition as an evolution of the previous condition and therefore it was always supplied in the study after the third condition. We also saw this condition as the current state of the art technique that we expected to perform superior than all the other conditions relying on mode switching. In the video we can now see that the clutching is still working just as in the previous condition, but since we can now scale the object with the touchpad, we don't need to switch between modes anymore. Tasks were completed once in mid-air and once on a table. For each task, users had to align four objects, that we can see here, with their respective targets. The objects were modeled in a way that you would not at first sight see how they would fit the target, so they would need to be inspected after being picked up. After the correct adjustments in rotation, translation and scale were found, the target would turn green and users had now 3 seconds left to further improve the result. We choose rather large thresholds and see automatic termination to further communicate that the task should be solved as quickly as possible. For consistency, each task was repeated once. 
Before we evaluate the results, a quick overview of the study procedure. Prior to the actual tasks, participants were shown a video of all conditions and had to complete a simpler preliminary alignment task until they felt comfortable with each method. A short voice recording indicated the controller techniques that had to be used when we applied a new condition. For each condition, a fixed succession of four objects that we saw on the previous slide had to be aligned with their respective targets. To control for a learning effect, we permuted and balanced the sequence of objects while each object was associated with a predefined transformation. To counterbalance the succession for the conditions, um, we randomly selected 30 of 36 possible orderings. Task 1 was executed before task 2, and as we said, condition 3 was always executed before condition 4, as indicated by the illustration here. Now let's have a look at the results for all conditions and total task time. On the left we see the results for task 1 and on the right for task 2. For the first task we can see that the sphere performed significantly faster than the two menu based controller conditions but was not faster than the simultaneous 7 degree of freedom interaction that in turn outperformed all other conditions. It is interesting to note what actually caused the advantages for the sphere. We see that the times for scaling were significantly lower than for controller buttonless and controller button with menu, meaning that the scaling by rotation actually appears to be working quite well for the sphere. For the second task, the same picture shows the sphere again outperforms condition 2 and 3, while the simultaneous 7 degree of freedom interaction again outperforms all other conditions, but now with the exception of the sphere. Here we now see results for seven questions of the post-experiment questionnaire that were answered on a 10-point Likert scale. The sphere condition mostly scored on par with the state-of-the-art method, while the two other conditions constantly receive worse ratings. Even so, the sphere scores lower ratings on average than the fourth condition, except for the rating for fun. It is not significantly outperformed by the fourth condition. To sum up the results, we can see that the sphere performed significantly faster than the two other menu-based interaction techniques. We also see that the increased hardware complexity for condition 3 did not generate a better result. So the clutching technique in combination with the menu did, contrary to our expectations, not perform better than if the controller was just used in the same way as the sphere. There were no significant advantages for the sphere in combination with the rigid surface. However, the sphere was not anymore outperformed by the 7 degree of freedom technique in the second task, the table task. We also can say that the sphere is the closest to the state of the art method, both in terms of subjective user ratings and task completion time. Lastly, we have to acknowledge that the simultaneous 7 degree of freedom interaction is significantly faster than all other techniques except for the sphere in the second task. If we search for reasons for the outline results, we clearly can attribute the advantages of the spherical device that were most constantly influenced by quicker scaling to the ergonomics of the device due to the fact that we deliberately added no hardware complexity to the sphere. The sphere also generated at some point better results in selection times. This could be due to the um, more clearly recognizable center point of the sphere in comparison to an asymmetrical controller. Also, our focus was on the sphere. A comparison between the controller conditions 2 and 3 revealed that controller buttonless was faster but had lower scores for subjective ratings. A possible cause for this could be the greater fatiguing effects that users also reported and that may be caused by the rotation of an asymmetrical object. As said, the sphere did not generate advantages from the table condition, but the fact that it was not outperformed by condition 4 could serve as a good starting point for future research in conjunction with a rigid surface. In conclusion, we can say that for our tasks, the spherical device has significant advantages in comparison to an asymmetrical mode-based controller.
The Sphere was only outperformed by substantially more complex hardware. Therefore, we can say that the spherical controller is, as long as we can supply a simultaneous seven degree of freedom interaction by physical buttons, a very decent option for 3D manipulation in AR. The high ratings in naturalness and ease of learning certainly incite future research for rotational symmetrical objects as the Sphere for 3D object manipulation. Extensions could involve real or simulated buttons or a simulated multi-touch surface so that the sphere would also be able to provide simultaneous seven degree of freedom interaction. Thank you for the attention. David for that great talk and I have a first question on Slido. Okay. It says, um, nice talk. Did you explore other shapes like a cube, anything symmetrical, I imagine? Uh, no, not for this talk. Uh, for this paper, we for this paper we really only focus on the on the sphere. But um, yeah, it certainly would be interesting to test the sphere against uh, other shapes. I mean, one obvious uh, disadvantage for the sphere is that um, yeah, you cannot place it uh, on a table um, without it, it rolling off. So <laughs> um, a cube also would certainly ha has its advantages. Yeah. Um. We have another question on Slido. This one okay. asks, since the spherical system doesn't have any orientation, is there not a problem for orienting and performing any particular tasks, especially when compared with more asymmetrical input methods? Yes, yeah, that's true. Um, so that's one, one disadvantage that the sphere has. And um, for this particular project, we did not um, have anything that was sticking out of the surface of the sphere. But what you actually can do um, is that um, you, you can uh, give some sort of a point of, ref of a reference on the surface of the sphere, so that can be used to to reorient the sphere. But for this project, we um, deliberately did, did not do this because um, we wanted to have a, a completely clean surface in order to have no uh, problems with that, that table condition. But but yeah, it, it's um, it, it might might help it at some point to have like a a point to reorient it. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, we don't have any other questions right now, Slido, so I'm going to ask you one, mostly wondering uh -huh. why, in terms of rotation, right, rotation is happening using your wrist, and it doesn't matter what you're holding in your hand, essentially that's what you're moving to cause a rotation. So why do you think that the spherical shape made a difference versus the handle controller when it came to rotation and scaling and things like that? Yeah, I mean, that was a surprising part that the, the scaling operation really worked very well uh, by rotation. Um, why is that so? Yeah, I mean, the, the spherical shape, of course, um, enhances rotation. I mean, it can be more easily rotated as it's an asymmetrical object. I think that's uh, something that clearly, clearly proved with this um, uh, work. Um, but we, we uh, to be honest, we really didn't expect the scaling with the sphere to be work or to be, work, be working that well. Mm -hmm. And um, I think part of this why this worked well is, is um, the, the metaphor that how we did it, so that you would rot rotate it towards yourself. So you kind of would drag it to towards yourself, and by rotating it away, it would also kind of push it away from yourself. Mm -hmm. So so I think this is part of why this worked. But um, yeah, actually, kind of explained 100 percent. Yeah. Okay. okay, one last quick question. Have okay. you considered using different spheres or different sizes for different types of tasks? Um, yeah, we actually, yeah, we actually did this uh, for other projects, um, but for this project, we um, stuck with this 12 centimeter sphere um, due to the advantages that I named on the construction slide because it. Um, it's basically the, own, the, the smallest ones that you still can ha ha um, hold in one hand. If you use a larger one, you, you 
basically have to use two hands. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's certainly possible for, for other projects that we also did to, to use a larger sphere. Um, uh, mainly because then you get a way larger display area and, and you have have like a, a um, tangible handheld spherical display. And while this sphere was more more of a controller, um, while it also had display capabilities for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, we are out of time for questions, but okay. we'll be right back as we transition to our next speaker. Thank you again, David. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Doug Bowman presenting the paper, Pseudo-Haptic Display of Mass and Mass Distribution During Object Rotation in Virtual Reality. Again, please ask any questions on Slido. Over to you, Doug. Okay, thanks very much for the introduction and um, uh, welcome everybody to this talk, uh, wherever you are in the world, thanks for joining. So I'm gonna be presenting the work of my former PhD student, Ron Yu, uh, who did this work at uh, Virginia Tech. And uh, the, the work is about pseudo-haptics, as the title indicates. Um, it actually came out of uh, Run's work on gestural, bare hand gestural interaction for virtual reality. And what he found in his previous work was that one of the things that was really compelling about the sorts of gestures he was using was a, a pseudo-haptic effect where you could feel uh, the, the mass of objects that you were pushing around in space. So that's what led to this work. So how do we provide mass sensations in VR in general? Where there's, there's two kind of um, uh, typical approaches. So on the right, uh, we could just use a passive haptic prop like this tennis racket. Uh, so if we just slap a tracker on there, then the object has the right size, it has the right shape, and in particular for this paper, it has the right mass. Uh, but that's very special purpose, and so others would like to use a more general purpose haptic device, like the one on the left. And here we can uh, present mass of different objects at different times, um, but the device is expensive and cumbersome and it has limited range. So what we'd really like to do is to use a generic proxy, um, as in the previous talk, uh, like this Vive tracker, uh, to provide mass sensations for various objects in a, in a flexible way. So a question we were asking was, how can we enable these realistic sensations of mass with the flexibility and generality of a generic proxy? And I want to point out that it's not just mass overall that we care about. It's also mass distribution. Uh, so here's uh, a page that I found online when I was looking around uh, where someone wanted to do a golf simulator with the Wii. Um, and of course, if you just hold the Wii remote in your hand, uh, it doesn't have the right mass, but even more importantly, it doesn't have the right mass distribution uh, because in a golf club, almost all the weight is at the end in the, in the club head. And so when you swing the re Wii remote by itself, it doesn't feel anything like a golf club. So this, this person you know, attached a Wii remote to a real golf club in order to achieve that mass distribution sensation. Again, can we enable these realistic sensations of mass distribution with the flexibility and generality of a generic proxy? So of course this has been done uh, quite a bit in prior work with pseudo haptics. And the typical approach is just to change the control display ratio uh, while manipulating a generic proxy. And changing that control display ratio induces changes in mass perception. So for example, the images on the bottom right from Samad et al uh, show that, you know, as you move the, uh, the prop uh, up, 
the, the visual representation of that in VR lags behind uh, by changing the CD ratio, and that makes the object feel heavier. And so why does this work? Well, there's two different types of cues that the user is getting. So the user is getting visual cues, obviously, that influence their perception of movement, specifically acceleration. And you're getting proprioceptive cues from the movement of your hand and arm that influence your perception of force. So basically, the brain can kind of calculate an estimate of the mass uh, by using this form of Newton's law. Um, so that prior work has all focused on uh, object translations. And what we asked was, can we generate these mass sensations during object rotations? So it's important to understand how this works in the real world when we're rotating objects. So the amount of effort that's needed to rotate an object is affected by both its overall mass and its mass distribution. Uh, and that's captured in the concept of moment of inertia. So we're familiar with Newton's law, F equals MA. The rotational version of that, of course, is that torque equals the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. And so we've got torque, which is the analog of force. We've got angular acceleration, which is the analog of acceleration. And moment of inertia is the analog of mass, and it incorporates both mass and mass distribution. If you think about kind of rotating these two bars, these two iron bars, uh, if we rotate it uh, around the center, as shown in the top image, that might be hard depending on how heavy the iron bar is. But if we rotate it around one end, it's even harder. It requires more torque to do that because more of the mass uh, is out at the end of the bar. So our research questions were about interactive rotation of a virtual object with a generic proxy object. And we first wanted to ask, does this CD ratio technique that has been used for object translation, does it also work for rotation? And does it properly influence the user's perception of the relative total mass of the virtual object? And then secondly, we asked how can we effectively display non-uniform mass distribution of the virtual object during rotation? So for the first question, uh, we ran an experiment on relative total mass perception. And our pseudo-haptic technique was very simple. So we used a Vive tracker as shown before as the physical proxy. We used the direct zero order control technique. So uh, movements of the Vive Tracker were directly reflected in movements of the virtual object. Uh, this was done via remote control. So the object was not at the location of the tracker. The object was uh, farther out in space. And it was three off rotation only because we were interested in, in focusing in on rotation. And the technique was simply to scale the control display ratio for rotational motion by measuring the relative orientation change of the proxy every frame and then applying the scaled orientation change to the virtual object. And the scale factor uh, could, um, uh, could be less than one, in which case the object would move more slowly than your hand was moving. And we hypothesized that that would lead to a perception that the object was heavier. Or the scale factor could be greater than one, in which case it moved faster, and we would expect people to perceive the object as being lighter. So in the experiment, it was a very simple setup. Uh, we had a two alternative force choice judgment of relative mass between two virtual objects. The two objects were cubes. Uh, they were identical in visual appearance, appearance, one on the left and one on the right. Uh, one of them always had a uh, one to one uh, CD ratio and the other had a scaled CD ratio. And so here's a quick video of how that looked in VR. Uh, this was using an HTC Vive Pro. So you would select an object with the uh, left-hand controller and then rotate it using the Vive Tracker. You can see in this case, the one on the left is moving more slowly. And so we expect the user to answer that that object feels heavier. The experiment had 17 participants. Uh, four were females. They were from uh, 21 to 26 years of age. And as far as our conditions, we used eight different scale factors. And note here that scale factor is actually the reciprocal of the CD ratio. Um, so four scale factors that were slower than one-to-one -one and four that were faster than one-to-one. -one. Uh, participants did 24 trials, three for each of the CD ratios, and we measured both the correctness of the trial as well as we asked them some subjective questions about their experience of uh, perception of mass in this study. So here are the results for correctness, and uh, they look really good. <laughs> so uh, for six out of of the uh, out of the eight uh, scale factors, uh, we see that participants achieved either 100% or practically 100% correctness. They could perceive which one uh, was was uh, supposed to be heavier. 
for the two CD ratios that were closest to one, uh, people were still uh, perceiving the, the, uh, uh, the mass correctly in about 80% of the trials. So we don't, uh, we, we, we don't see a threshold here where we drop below, uh, below random chance, but it's somewhere very close to 1.0. Uh, all of these conditions were significantly higher than random chance. In terms though of subjective experience, um, we asked them six questions and we adapted this questionnaire from Rietzler et al's paper from CHI 2018. And you see the questions there. Um, here are the results. So um, for all six questions, we have scores uh, uh, that are between one and three uh, on average. And uh, in fact, statistically, all of these answers are significantly higher than zero. So people did feel subjectively that the cubes had different weights, that the weight difference felt realistic, and so on. All right, so in terms of answering question one, does this CD ratio technique work for rotation? The answer is pretty unequivocally yes. Uh, even for pretty small differences in CD ratio, uh, people could correctly perceive the difference and they reported subjectively that they felt the difference as well. So moving on to the harder question now, how can we display non-uniform mass distribution of the virtual object? So we actually developed two techniques for this. Um, the first is called the pivot point technique. And this is based on the, uh, the observation that when we grab objects in the real world, we typically tend to grab them near the center of mass if we can perceive that before picking it up because then the object is balanced in our hands. So we uh, took advantage of this in the technique and just decided that wherever the user, wherever the user uh, picked up the object, that we would just use the center of mass as a pivot point and maintain a constant one-to-one -one CD ratio otherwise. We hypothesized that when we did this, the users would perceive that they were grasping the object at the center of mass and that the center of mass was offset towards the heavier part of the object. So in the example on the left, the darker parts of the, of the cube are, uh, are supposed to be heavier. And so the center of mass is kind of towards the bottom right of the object in this image. When the user would rotate uh, the controller, uh, they would see the object rotate around that center of mass. And of course the center of mass was not displayed to them as it was here. Uh, the second technique is called the uh, dynamic torque technique. And here we wanted to relax the restriction that users have to grab the object that's at the center of mass. And instead we wanted them to be able to rotate it around the geometric center as you normally would when you select a virtual object. And so the question is how to change the rotation so that you can perceive the mass distribution differences. Um, so of course, when you do this, uh, gravity generates a torque um, uh, based on where the center of mass is. So in this example, uh, gravity is generating a torque downward through that center of mass. And what we want to happen is that when you rotate the object kind of against gravity, so that the center of mass is having to fight gravity as it rotates, we want it to rotate more slowly. And then when you rotate the other direction where gravity is helping, we want it to rotate more quickly. So that's the idea we wanted to, uh, to come to. And so to do that, we uh, relied on this basic uh, equation uh, for rotational motion. And uh, we designed an, uh, uh, an algorithm that would generate an amount of virtual object rotation for each frame based on how far the physical controller was rotated in that frame, uh, the torque due to gravity and the mass distribution of the object as represented by uh, its moment of inertia, and also the mass distribution of the physical proxy. Um, one other thing to note about this, uh, about this algorithm is that we guaranteed a certain small amount of movement of the virtual object in the direction that the controller had moved uh, in order to avoid weird situations where you rotate the controller one direction and the object rotates in another direction because of the strength of the of gravity's torque. Um, so the details on this are in the paper. Here's the experiment that we ran. So again, we used the Vive Tracker as a physical proxy, and this time we gave people full six degree freedom control, so more realistic than the previous study. And we we showed them this uh, virtual cube that was divided into eight subcubes, and we simply asked them to judge which of the subcubes was heavier than the others. So one out of the eight was always virtually heavier, heavier than the others. You couldn't tell visually. And here's how we defined uh, that, uh, that heavy subcube. So um, we basically had four different conditions for the mass ratio between the heavy cube uh, and the light 
subcubes. Uh, the first ratio was three to one. And so that just moved the center of mass of the overall object slightly away from the center. We also had a 6.33 to one and a 13 to one and a 33 to one ratio. And you see the locations of the center of mass for each of those. So here's what that looked like with the pivot point technique. So as you're rotating the virtual object, you can rotate it as much as you want. And when you perceive which cube you believe is the heavier subcube, you select it with the Vive controller. And then here's what that looks like with the dynamic torque technique. And in both of these conditions, both of these techniques, we encourage people to uh, rest their elbows on the table and to explore um, rotation of the, uh, of the proxy with two hands. Okay, so uh, in this experiment, we had the same 17 participants as the previous. It was just a follow on to the previous experiment. They did 16 trials, four in each configuration. And again, we measured correctness and subjective experience. So here are the correctness results. So you can see that the dy dynamic torque technique um, had uh, above 50% correctness for all four uh, configurations. Uh, the pivot point technique did worse in, in, in each of those configurations. If we look at the significant differences between the two techniques for all but the heaviest uh, or the, the largest ratio, uh, mass ratio between the heavy and light subcubes, the dynamic, tor dynamic torque technique was better than the pivot point technique. And if we look at just results relative to random chance, one out of eight, uh, we see that in all four cases, the dynamic torque technique was better than random chance significantly, uh, but only in the, the two larger cases was the pivot point technique better. In terms of subjective experience, here are the results. And we see that for four of the questions, dynamic torque had significantly higher ratings than the pivot point technique. Um, and for all the questions, dynamic torque was significantly higher than zero, but only for two of the questions was the pivot point technique higher than zero. So our conclusion for research question two is that if we dynamically adjust the CD ratio as the center of mass moves, then we do get effective perception, even when the center of mass is near the geometric center. So to wrap up, the contributions of this work are really about effective pseudo haptic display of mass and mass distribution when we're rotating virtual objects. And we note that we can do this even with a non-ideal physical proxy. I wish we had a sphere like the one in the previous talk, but we just used a, a plain Vive tracker. Also wanna note that these techniques can be combined with each other to get uh, perception of total mass and mass distribution at the same time. And we can combine these techniques with pseudo haptic translation techniques as well. So in the future, we'd like to do that, put all, the, all of these techniques together and also evaluate them in a more ecologically valid task. We want to reduce our reliance on empirically determined parameters for dynamic torque. We'd like to explore the influence of the proxies mass and mass distribution. And finally, we want to study absolute mass perception and not just relative mass perception. But thank you very much, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you for the talk, Doug. Um, we have a couple of questions on Slido. The first one is by Felipe Almeida, who's asking, when using the scale or asking about perception of mass only, do you think you may have framed the user to think that the only possible explanation is the variation of mass? What other aspects might have influenced the perception? Uh, that's a good question. So, you know, certainly they knew that we were asking about experience of mass. Um, and so, uh, that may have biased them to, to think that the only explanation for the visual differences that they saw were differences in mass. Um, it's hard for me to think of, of a way to get around that bias experimentally. Um, and it's, it's very difficult to see just from the videos that I'm showing here, kind of what this technique is like. Um, but I can report to you from my own experience, and it, it matches the subjective experience of these participants, that it's a very compelling perception and again, it's, it's a perception of relative mass, right? So just that you know, one thing is heavier than another or one of the parts of the object is heavier than another. You don't get a good perception, of course, of absolute mass with this. Thank you. Um, one more quick question off of Slido. Uh, Tong Yi is asking if it makes any difference to people's perception of the mass when the distance from the object to the user changes. Uh, that's something that we have not tested. Um, my, in the case that we were testing, I don't believe it would uh, because all of the manipulation you're doing is, is local. So um, as long as you can 
see the the changes in the visual motion of the object, I think you should still get the same sort of relative mass and mass distribution perceptions uh, because that proprioceptive cue is always going to be the same. It, it would only be a problem, I think, if the object was so far away or if the rotations were so small that you just couldn't see them. All right, with that, let's thank Doug for his great talk and uh, we'll be back with the next speaker in a second. Our next speaker is Victor Mercado presenting the paper, Design and Evaluation of Interaction Techniques Dedicated to Integrate Encounter Type Haptic Displays in Virtual Environments. Over to you, Victor. All right, thank you for the introduction. So let's begin because this is actually a very long title and there's a lot of things to explain. So let's begin with the basics. What are encounter type haptic displays? Basically, they are hi-fi robots. So these emotionally needed robots, actually what they are want to do is just to establish contact with the user, looking for the user hand position in order for them to encounter them, hence the name encounter type haptic displays, so they can establish contact as you can see in the video over here. So this is a pretty interesting approach because actually what they permit is to have a hand-free contact with the surface without the burden of actually wearing an actuator right below the user's skin. So this approach is actually quite interesting, but of course there's a lot of things to do in these kind of displays. What are the challenges that we need to overcome? We need to render a large contact area. We need to avoid lag because as you can see in the video, the robot is actually taking some time to displace to one position to another. But as well, what we want to do is to avoid unexpected collisions with the user because we don't want to actually stab the user <laughs> while just moving uh, the contact area as well. So what did we did in order to address these issues? The contributions of this paper are basically the design of the uh, a design space for the interaction techniques. And these techniques are actually the ones designed 
for addressing these issues as well. So we can see five interaction techniques departing from this design space. And we also created a use case scenario where we actually contextualize these interaction techniques and as well as a user study to test the performance of these techniques. So let me show you what we did. So basically the task is pretty interesting <laughs> for not to say fun, because actually what we have is a scenario where the users can actually paint with their fingers. And as you can see, they have the need to paint uh, over a large surface that is not over that is not there. As you can see, uh, they're actually displacing that prop which uh, users have contact with. So the objective is basically just to color the shapes as you can see here in the video, just for accomplishing the task of painting. But before getting into there, let's just talk a little bit about the related work. So basically we consider two types of contact area for ETHDs. The first is the static contact area. Basically, this means that the contact area is just going to rest over one position. And there are two types of static contact area. One that is dedicated to complete object surface representation, basically meaning that the user can actually touch the entirety of the object, as we can see here in the work of Abtahi et al. But we also have partial object surface representation that is present, for instance, in the work of Araujo et al. So for instance, here the user can actually touch one little part of this virtual shoe. But we can also movable contact area, as such in the case of the haptic revolver by Whitmer et al. And also in a previous work that was presented like four hours ago, <laughs> uh, basically Entropia, which is basically the same rotating prop approach, but this time integrated for ETHDs. So yeah, in case that you were actually interested in watching this, you already missed your chance. And so let's talk about the summary and limitations of, of these works. Of course, uh, the contact area for most of the ETHDs is actually limited to the prop size. So as you can see, for instance, the user can only touch what is um, depicted over here, this little, uh, this little um, texture texture face of the of this virtual prop of this prop. And basically, the interaction techniques there's no overall consensus on what uh, it needed to do in order to create an interaction technique for ETHDs. As you can see here, the contact area is mainly highlighted in red or in other colors as well, but it's not overall uh, like a consensus. We have also the same work from Aptahi et al. That for instance, she's actually touching a contact area that is specified over here. But beyond that, we don't have any more consensus in, as, at the best of our knowledge about interaction techniques for ETHDs. So let's uh, talk about actually our, our proposition, our contribution, which is basically the, these interaction techniques. So let's return again to the, the test that we use in order to test the performance, which is basically just explore a large contact area, as you can see. Um, so let's talk about the design space construction because first, it's not only about to create interaction things per se, but we also need a framework. So basically this design space that could, that could help us to know which are the parameters that are the most important for creating these interaction techniques. So we consider four uh, necessary parameters that are fundamental for an interaction between user and ETHD. So the first one is input. And we consider two branches for input. One is just providing input through a controller. And the other one is just by ge doing gestures that the system is going to recognize in order to give instruction to the ETC system. The other one is movement control. You actually, uh, in order, once the ETC is actually uh, beginning to displace, do we want for that to come automatically? Or we actually need to manually tell the system, go to this position or go to another position? And we also have displacement. If the displacement is going to be absolute, it's going to be reached in only one step, or for getting to position A to position B, it's actually going to just achieve that in, in little steps or little increments. What we also consider as well, having contact with the surface, do we want for the users to always have contact with the surface while it's rendering, or do we want for users just to take out uh, contact of, uh, of the contact area? So overall, after considering these four parameters, as well as the branches, we consider this interaction, this design space for the interaction techniques. And we consider all these possibilities, but of course, at the end, we conceive interaction techniques that represent only different combination of these branches because we cannot implement this huge quantity of interaction techniques. And we also need to uh, specify that, for instance, for control input, we didn't consider automatic movement control because that will be like just controlling remotely the, the robots at the end. That's that's not the um, purpose of ETHDs. 
So of course, each of the interaction techniques represent at least one branch of the four parameters. And I'm going to talk more about these uh, interaction techniques in just a second. So let's begin with the first one. The first one is called swipe. And as the name says, users need to swipe in order to move the contact area. The system actually detects the gesture and erases, for instance, the spill paint. And yet that's how the user actually move the contact area. As you can see, that is represented over this uh, green and red circle. And basically that's it. And actually the circle is following the direction of the swipe. We have also the clutch technique, which is pretty interesting because users need to use the clutch, the trigger of the bike controller, so they can hold it and they can select a new contact area by just releasing their finger, as you can see here, and they can select the contact area by just releasing the trigger of the controller. And that's how they can explore uh, the, the space. The drag technique is quite similar. Oh, the drag technique is actually quite similar to, to the clutch one, but this does not uh, necessarily need, does not need at all uh, the controller. It's only a matter of the height of the finger that actually helps the users to select the, select the contact area, as you can see in the video. Bubble is actually quite interesting because it works like some sort of a steering wheel. So depending on the user, when it touches the, the contact area, the border of the contact area, the users can actually displace uh, on the on a specific direction as, as the user one. But actually, uh, for this technique, um, users need to be always in contact with the contact area. And finally, we have the follow technique, which is basically uh, just lifting off the finger and waiting for the robot to actually follow all the time while the finger is hovering in the air. So basically, that's a continuous following of, of the of the user's finger. And at the end, uh, users can deactivate the interaction technique by just touching again over the virtual prop. So I think that we have already talked a lot about the use case, but I will just specify a little about the things that we used in order to implement it. So basically, we use a robotic device, a UR, Universal Robots UR5. We also use uh, the Vive system for rendering the virtual environment. We use as well the, the tracking system for the base station. Um, we additionally used uh, the Vive tracker for acknowledging the, the user's finger position because we actually render that in the virtual environment, as you could see. So uh, in order to evaluate the performance of these techniques over the, the uh, painting finger task, uh, what we did was just to compare all the interaction techniques over this, over this task. So we have like five experimental blocks, one per interaction technique. So at the end, these blocks were uh, divided into four experimental trials, one training trial where users actually needed to intercept these little cubes over here, and three experimental trials, which actually comprised the task of coloring the, the shapes. And each of the tasks actually had a duration of four minutes. So the collected data, we took into account the lapse time for each trial. We took into account this little, <laughs> this interior shape coloring percentage, which is basically uh, the, the area that the users didn't color in the shape. And exterior shape coloring percentage is just a very sophisticated way to say uh, the amount of spilled paint that was outside the, the contour of the, of the figures. And the painting error percentage is just considered the two previous one. And at the end of the experiment, we also integrated a user experience questionnaire to evaluate the user experience overall for the participants. And we gathered a population of 20 participants for this experiment. So these are the performances. As you can see, this is a good performance, an average performance, and a bad performance uh, in matters of painting. But of course, we actually wanted to, to quantify the performance in more specific terms. So these are the, the quantitative results. As you can see, Clutch took the lead on this one, basically got the best results for overall the conditions, and Drag came in second place. But uh, we also ran a statistical analysis for these conditions. So for instance, there are differences for the swipe technique between Clutch, Bubble, and Follow. There's also significant differences between Clutch and Bubble and, and Drag. And also for the painting error percentage, there are significant differences uh, between Swipe, Clutch, Drag, and Follow. And considering bubble as well, he, it has differences with all with all the rest of the conditions. And we also take into account, of course, the user experience features. So we have seven features over here, and 
we also run an statistical analysis to identify which one actually we found uh, significant differences between them. So as you can see, controllable, captivating, motivating, easy to learn, and fast work. Yes, actually user experience features that uh, users actually value the most, uh, notably for clutch and drag, and also follow overall bubble had a mediocre um, performance and swipe was actually had not very positive results as well. So what's you, what's to take into account here? For instance, visual feedback, actually we received a lot of comments from participants telling that visual feedback was super helpful for them to acknowledging what the system was going to do and what the system actually did. So for instance, here we have the contact area that is being represented on the circle. And when it's green, actually it's telling the user that you can touch the, the surface. And for instance, here we can see a more complicated, um, let's say visual feedback, because actually here, for instance, this is just for telling the user, this is the auxiliary contact area. This is when the contact area is actually rendering, but this also means the displacement of the robot, as you can see. So all this visual feedback should help the users to understand better what was going on with the system because we cannot, we cannot like increase, for instance, the speed of the robot because that actually will be just playing with the safety of the user and we don't want that as well. So in matters of overall performance, we have to take into account that, uh, uh, we have to take into account, for instance, the complexity of the shapes. For instance, uh, participants told us that actually coloring the triangle was always the hardest because of the edges and coloring the circles was actually quite easy because there are not that hard edges and the score was actually neutral. And for instance, very interesting uh, drag and follow techniques were the slowest one, but that's probably due to the fit slow because actually users or participants in this case took the time for pointing uh, to the contact area that they want to touch. And of course that also takes time. So at the end, that's actually an important factor to take into account. So basically this is the performance of these techniques for the painting test. And let's take into account that very seriously because it doesn't mean that overall type is bad. That doesn't mean that overall clutch is going to be good in all the cases. So in conclusion, we created a design space that helped us as a tool for creating new interaction techniques uh, with four important parameters, input, mobile control, displacement, and contact. Overall, five interaction techniques were conceived, swipe, clutch, drag, bubble, and follow. We created the use case scenario, which in this case is the painting task. And overall, we create, we also conducted a user study for analyzing uh, quantitative and qualitative data. Our results were favorable for clutch and drag. And future work can also comprise many, many different things. For instance, we can also analyze the overall performance for surface rendering of these techniques in this particular task. We can also consider new parameters uh, for the design space. We can create new interaction techniques for the unexplored parameters of, of the previous design space. And we can also consider new use cases, scenarios, application scenarios for these techniques. And we can also consider, for instance, using these techniques for 3D surface rendering. I mean, the possibilities are actually quite interesting in matters of future work. And thank you guys for your for your time, for your attention. And please do not hesitate in asking, in asking questions. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you, Victor, for a fun talk. Um, I have a couple of questions off a slide out. The first right. one is, in the painting application, a table of canvas would be a better experience and much cheaper. Can you provide more context for situations where encounter high haptic displays would be more useful? Yeah, because in this approach in particular, what we wanted to do is actually to also um, optimize the rendering area of this uh, of encounter type haptic displays. I mean, of course, in this particular, uh, we consider the, the to use a canvas for painting task because it's also uh, it was actually easier to implement because we we had only a uh, in this case uh, a two D surface. But once we extend this to a three D a three D environment to have to have these interaction techniques to touch a three D volume, then the things get more complicated, and we can no longer rely on passive haptics. Or at least we need um, a super complicated passive haptic setup in order to render more complicated uh, uh, more complicated scenarios. Let's say. Um, I have another question. Um, Slido says from Felipe Almeida says very nice work. Um, the motor task Thank may you. lead to an interdependence between performance and the relative ability to do the task, which is painting the area. Is mm -hmm. there a task in which you foresee a different result from those interactions? 
Hmm, that's a pretty interesting question. I mean, it, it could be a matter of um, conceiving a, a new a new task for for this uh, for evaluating the uh, the performance of these interaction techniques. At this moment, um, uh, we need to reflect a lot on that, but we are completely sure that the performance of these interaction techniques is going to change a lot. Uh, and as I told, as I mentioned, for instance, perhaps the lower performance of bubble and swipe was due to the fact that actually the, the technique of painting with the finger was actually quite similar to the gesture that they used to control the interaction technique. Perhaps if we come with something different, then perhaps th those interaction techniques might have a better performance, for instance. Hi, one last question. Was a robot moving in a predetermined trajectory or was it dependent on the user's performance? And why were all the contact surfaces on the same horizontal plane? Yeah, uh, overall, to, to the second question, yeah, overall, uh, they were all on, these, uh, on the same level. It was always this flat surface. And for this, for the first, uh, for the first question, it depended a lot. For instance, for swipe, uh, the direction of the swipe actually marked the direction where the robot is actually going to displace, and also for the bubble, uh, depending on the on the relationship between the edge uh, and the center of, of the of touching the um, the contact area, the robot is going to displace into the direction. As for instance, you can see here in the video, and for the other one, it's just basically the position that the user specifies. Uh, with that, we're out of time for questions, and we'll be right back as we transition to our next speaker. Okay. Thank you. All right, everyone, welcome back. Our next speaker is Lu Zhao, who will present the paper, Implementation and Evaluation of Touch-Based Interaction Using Electro-Vibration Haptic Feedback in Virtual Environments. Hello, everyone. My name is Lu Zhao. I'm from Beijing Institute of Technology. In this report, I will introduce our work. The title is Implementation and Evaluation of Touch-Based Interaction Using Electrical Vibration Haptic Feedback in Virtual Environments. I will introduce our work in the five sections. The first is the introduction. Presentation of more haptic information to improve the user's interactive capability is an important and challenging task in the virtual environment. Certain interactive devices of the current VR systems are able to provide haptic feedback. However, there are some limitations of these devices, like the inflexible system structure, the fixed interface, and loud vibration noise. The electrical vibration generates haptic effects on a touch screen, and the friction between the touch screen and the user's fingertip is modulated via electrostatic forces. The properties of the electrical vibration, including the accurate feedback for finger pads, silence, low cost, and rich haptic feedback rendering, can be effectively applied to interaction in VR. Although a lot of researchers have considered enriching the interaction experiences based on electrical vibration touch screens, the potential utility of electrical vibration in VR systems is almost blank. So, we try to develop a dynamic haptic interface by employing electrical vibration techniques. We list the main contributions of our work. Firstly, it is the first work to introduce electrical vibration haptic feedback into the VR interaction. Secondly, we design a set of interactive modes. Thirdly, we explore the effectiveness of different electrical vibration haptic feedback through the movement time and the arrow of 3D targeting tasks. Last but not the least, we analyze the interaction with the EVTAP system in a virtual office application. Then we will introduce the design of our system. 
We designed the electro vibration tablet and named it the EV tab. We assembled a 10.1 inch device by considering its light weight and its adequate size for accurate manipulation. The weight of the tablet is about 500 gram, which is portable to be taken to any place. Similar to Bow's work, we use a 3M micro touch screen to generate the electrostatic friction force on the finger. We choose 150 Hz frequency sinusoidal signal as the stimulus of our system. Stop. To determine appropriate manipulation modes, we designed and analyzed a pre-study. We rendered a virtual environment with several 3D cube models in it by using Unity 3D. Six students who had experienced VR systems before participated in this part. They took on HTC Vive headset and were provided an EV tab without any haptic feedback and input functions as the interaction tool. The participants should imagine to act out their actions to select, translate, rotate, scale the cubes, and make simple labels in the virtual environment. We summarize the requirements by analyzing participants' behavior and their explanations. Obvious sensory feedback should be provided appropriately to guide users' attention. Interact with the assistance of haptics. Simple interactive actions, less physical movements to navigate in the virtual environment and manipulate the objects, visibility of the device and the hands. To satisfy the requirements, we tracked the physical EV type device using an HTC Vive tracker and tracked the participants' hands by mounting a lip motion device on the head mounted display. We render the 3D scene in the viewport of the user's head mounted display on the virtual EV tab. We categorize the electro vibration haptic feedback from previous researches as location based feedback, change based feedback, and homogeneous feedback. The location based feedback always generates at part of the device to present interface area or shapes of objects. The change based feedback increases the amplitude of feedback linearly along the sliding trajectory of the fingers. The homogeneous means the electro vibration is uniformly distributed on the whole device to present the surface roughness and frictions. We present electro vibration feedback adapted to the 3D interactions. For this selection, the object is selected when one finger taps the object rendered on the tablet and deselected when the finger lifts. Location-based feedback is displayed in the region of the rendered object's image on the device. We deliver the feedback with 250 volts of a stimulus to provide a distinct border for the 3D object. The homogeneous feedback is generated when the user's finger is inside the object, and no feedback is provided when the finger is outside the object. In the case of transforming objects, the gesture that one finger touches and slides on the touch screen translates the object in the XY orientation. Double tap, touch and slide in a horizontal direction translate the object in the user's view direction. The rotation and the uniform scale can be performed with two fingers. We use the change-based feedback according to the moving distance of the selected target in 3D scenarios. The amplitude linearly increases until the finger is close to the edge of the tablet and achieve the maximum feedback. To enable the drawing and writing, we use one finger to activate the edit window and draw in it. We provide homogeneous feedback to simulate haptic sensation of real papers or boards. We executed a fifth law task to explore the effects of different electro vibration modes on interactions in VR. In this study, 13 target spheres are arranged in a circle and displayed in the same depth in front of participants. The targets are activated and highlighted green at regular intervals along the perimeter of the circle. When the activated target is touched, it turns blue. If the current target isn't touched, the target is highlighted red and recorded as missed target. We measured movement time, throughput, error rate, and distance offset as dependent variables. We compared the results of four haptic feedback conditions. The target size are 8 and 50 mm. The circle radius are 30, 40, and 50 mm. According to the fifth law, the index of difficulty for pointing to a target was calculated with the target size and circle radius. 17 participants took part in our study. Since there were 12 recorded selections per circle, each participant performed a total of 864 trails. 
We analyzed the result with repeated measurement ANOVA on the dependent variables. Overall, there was a significant main effect of the electrical vibration haptic feedback on movement time, throughput, error rate, and distance offset. A post hoc test between different haptic feedback found that the movement time using the EVTAP with feedback 3 was significantly higher than the other feedback conditions. The throughput for movements by using the EVTAP with feedback 2 was significantly faster than the other conditions. The movement by using EVTAP with feedback 3 had lower throughput than the other three conditions. The interaction using the EVTAP had lower error rates for the 3D selection than no haptic feedback. The distance offset for interaction without electro vibration haptic feedback was significantly higher than with the haptic feedback. There was a significant main effect of the index of difficulty on movement time, throughput, error rate, and distance offset. We analyzed the slope of each view direction for movement time versus index of difficulty. The change-based feedback and homogeneous feedback showed a steeper slope than the other two conditions. We conducted a set of interaction tasks in a specific VR scenario to evaluate the user experience of our event hub. We built a virtual office scene in Unity to provide a VR immersive environment. We used a Utah teapot as a 3D object to be manipulated. Participants were asked to touch and select the teapot, select the specific option of the menu, translate the teapot, rotate it, change its size, and draw graphics according to templates in an edit window. We measured the completion times and error rates of participants' interactions and collected the subjective criteria to compare the interactions using the EVTAP and the ordinary tablet. Besides, we asked participants to fill in a NASA task load index and a system usability scale questionnaire. The same group of participants as the 3D targeting task took part in this experiment. We set three sets of parameters with different positions, orientations, and sizes for each task. For the task of drawing, geometry, graphics online, triangle, and sinusoid were displayed as templates. There was a total of 108 trials for each participant. To evaluate the errors of the selection and the translation, we used the Euclidean distance in pixels on the tablet between the user's pointing position and the target position. We analyzed the rotation error by calculating the angle between the rotate teapot and the target orientation. For the scale error, we calculated the error rate of the scale error relative to the original scale of the teapot. In the drawing task, we recorded the trace of the user's drawing and then calculated the distance offset to the graphic template. Statistical results of the repeated measurement ANOVA show that the errors of manual selection, translation, and rotation when provides electro vibration haptic feedback are significantly less than without haptic feedback. Several participants' responses might explain the errors of the object scale. When participants scaled the object, their fingers concentrated in the center area of the object, so they could not perceive apparent change of the electro vibration. In regard to the homogeneous haptic feedback, the offset between participants' trace and the templates are not significantly different between the EV tab and the ordinary tablet. One explanation can be that the homogeneous feedback may not influence the results of tracing tasks in VR. It needs to be verified in the future. A statistical analysis of the completion time shows a significantly shorter completion time when participants use the EV tab. The time to perform the object selection and the menu selection by using the EV tab are significantly shorter than using ordinary tablet. The homogeneous haptic feedback has the lowest speed and the least throughput than other feedback conditions in the 3D targeting task. The same with several participants claimed in this study. When felt the friction force on device, they decreased the movement speed and the texture-like sensations during performing the drawing task made them focus but on the contrary, it impeded the action. We compared the effect of the two interaction conditions to the workload by conducting a paired t-test. The results show that the interaction using EVTAB has significantly lower workload levels than using the ordinary tablet. The workload of the physical, temporal, performance, effort, and frustration are decreased when using the EVTAB. However, the results of the individual sub-aspect don't reach statistical significance.
We further inquired the participants' fatigue parts of their bodies. Participants' most and second discomforts were visual fatigue and cervical shoulder pain for the VR environment. Five participants selected the flicking fingers and two participants felt arms fatigue. With these results, we confirm that the EV tap is not the main factor that aggravates the fatigue and workload. The overall usability scores of our device range from 60 to 100. According to the service for comparing the system usability scale to adjective ratings, the system can be ranked as good. The paired t-test results show the differences of the usability scores between the EV tab and the ordinary tablet are not statistically significant, and there are no significant differences of the scale of the usability and learnability of two devices. The usability results show the electrical vibration cannot improve the usability. We infer that the usability of the system is mainly influenced by the manipulation method other than harsh sensations. We haven't compared our system with other interactive devices because our purpose is to explore the performance of electrical vibration haptic feedback for interaction in VR. Now let's make a conclusion. In our work, we explore a new touch-based interaction method using electrical vibration haptic feedback in virtual environments. By mapping three electrical vibration display miners with interactions in VR, we implement a portable space tracking interactive system, the EV tab. We then conduct a 3D targeting task in a virtual environment based on Fitz law to assess the performance and effects of the electrical vibration. Moreover, we construct a virtual office scenario with six interaction tasks to evaluate the effect and accurate of the interaction using our user interface. Finally, according to the experimental results, the precision of the virtual space interactions is significantly benefited from the electrical vibration haptic feedback. The analysis of the subjective criteria show that the use of the EV tab decreases the workload effectively, and the usability of the touch-based interaction method is satisfactory. There are also certain limitations in our work. For instance, the electrical vibration cannot improve the efficiency of interactions in VR obviously. Besides that, participants' sensitiveness for the electrical vibration is different. The effects of different waveforms, frequencies, and amplitudes of electrical vibration drive signals on interaction remain to be studied. Based on our preliminary study of the electrical vibration device in VR, we hope to inspire future research and designers to exploit more advantages of this technique to enhance interaction and user experience in VR systems. Here, I want to thank my supervisor, Professor Liu, for his instructions and thanks to the co-authors of our work. This work was supported by National Key Research and Development Program of China, the National Natural Science Foundation of China, and the 111 Project. Thanks for your listening. Thank you, Lou, for your talk. It was interesting to see how a new type of vibration haptic feedback could provide feedback in VR. Um, on, towards the end of the talk, you said that every individual responds differently to it. And I was wondering if for the user studies, did you do any kind of calibration for each individual or you went with some default baseline? Uh, you mean uh, the calibration? Uh, no, we haven't do that. Uh, we just uh, test the uh, electro electrical vibration happy feedback. Uh, we make a preliminary test uh, to uh, uh, tr uh, explore whether we can use the electrical vibration in the VR. So we made some uh, studies and uh, we didn't uh, compare it with other uh, devices uh, just uh, to make sure to uh, to uh, test uh, whether the electrical vibration has some effects on the manipulation in VR. Okay, um, so 
by using the tablet in VR, it almost seems like the 3D spatial interaction now suddenly becomes a 2D interaction on a flat screen, which does provide happy feedback. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about this loss of spatialness um, versus the gain of haptic feedback that you get in terms of the virtual experience. Uh, we use the tablet because uh, uh, the first reason is uh, all of us are familiar with the um, touch like uh, uh, touch manipulations uh, and uh, the uh, electrical vibration is dynamic to show us the um, different uh, uh, textures like the roughness. Um, uh, so we uh, we use the tablet uh, and uh, uh, in, implement the um, electro vibration with the tablets. Uh, and uh, mm, because there are some previous researchers that they have mm, make sure uh, they have uh, uh, explored the tablet uh, uh, devices in the VR. Uh, the tablet uh, is not just uh, use like uh, uh, mm, 2D, uh, 2D uh, manipulations, but it also can be used as some uh, handheld devices uh, together with like uh, hand gestures or like uh, the um, mechanism arms um, like this. So um, the electrical vibration uh, uh, touch screen, um, it is just the preliminary uh, study um, but uh, in the future, we want to uh, use the uh, electro vibration touch screen uh, with other uh, interaction uh, methods and uh, to um, explore some more uh, studies. Okay, great, thank you. Um, uh, we're gonna move on to our last talk. Uh, we'll be back in a few minutes, um, in a few seconds, I should say, after we transition to the next speaker. Thank you, Luke. Um, our last speaker of the day is Xiaoyu Kai, who's going to present the work Therm Air Glove, a pneumatic glove for thermal perception and material identification in virtual reality. Hello, everyone. I'm Xiaoyu Cai, PhD student from School of Creative Media, City University of Hong Kong. I will present our recent work, Thermal Air Glove, a pneumatic glove for thermal perception and material identification in virtual reality. Well, thermal air glove, it can provide controlled thermal feedback to support material identification in virtual environments and improve immersive experience in VR. And this work was done by City University of Hong Kong and the University of Tokyo. Uh, look at this figure, a user is wearing thermal air glove when he's grasping the copper ball in VR. And this is a VR sense, and this is a contacting temperature change which is similar with the real physical object made with copper material. In our daily life, when a real object is grasped in the hand, its surface material can be informed by the thermal cues. For different materials such as plastic, foam, steel, and glass, we can perceive different, thermal, uh, different levels of thermal sensations when we touch them one by one. Well, for example, when we touch a metallic bottle surface, we may feel cooler than a plastic bottle. Uh, the wooden door feels warmer than the metallic door handle. And this is because the thermal conductivity and heat capacity are different among these materials. So, it is possible to infer objects material based on the temperature change of human skin when contacting an object surface. 
Well, in host research, it gave us a warm process of thermal interaction, supporting material identification. When humans contact or touch the phys real physical objects, and the skin temperature response comes from the thermal receptors inside the skin to support cognitive process of material discrimination and recognition. Well, for different materials with significantly different thermal properties, such as foam, glass, and oleum, uh, the total change in skin temperature are different. It has been proved in the real physical objects, but it is challenging to perceive the virtual objects materials in VR. Well, generally, the rigid bacteria elements can provide controlled thermal cues or thermal feedback for users, and some previous research have proved that it is feasible to achieve material simulation by thermal controlling through bacteria elements. But actually, directly attaching the rigid bacteria elements on the user's hand may cause movement restriction which can affect the user's experience in VR. Well, on the other hand, the pneumatic bearable device is feasible and lightness. It is possible to use the pneumatic device to provide thermal feedback instead of bacteria elements to support material identification in VR. So to explore the feasibility of material identification in VR, in our work, we present thermal air glove which is a pneumatic glove with embedded airbags inside the nylon elastic glove to generate controllable pneumatic thermal feedback. And this is an RGB image of thermal air glove and, and uh, this is a thermal image of thermal air glove. So look at this picture, you can see the thermal air glove could quickly change its temperature when pumping cold air into the airbags. Uh, well, we designed the thermal air glove consisting of a pneumatic glove with five inflatable airbags attaching on fingers and the pan, and two temperature chambers, one hot and one cold, and a pneumatic and temperature air pumping system. The airbags are made with the thin and light PE sheets, and there is a Type K thermocouple installed in the middle finger airbag. Well, the thermal couple will sense the user's skin temperature and provides real-time coring temperature for air pumping system. And we also developed these two temperature chambers using bacteria-based modules. And there were two bacteria inside the chamber with the heat sink toolkit outside. For the hot chamber, the maximum temperature is at 68 degrees, and for the cold chamber, is about 2 degrees. An external 24 voltage and 5 ampere power supplies to drive the pneumatic system, and this is a wall design of hardware for our system. And this is a system diagram of thermal air glove. In the thermal and pneumatic control system, we use a Duno board, chose uh, three air pumps for inflation and one pump for deflation through servo valves. And to reduce the heat transfer during the pumping process, uh, the cold and hot pumps were placed into the temperature chambers. Well, we use the HTC Vibe Pro headset and leap motion to detect hand gestures. When user wearing thermal air glove, the pump tube will deflate the airbags. When, uh, when touching or grasping different materials in virtual environments, and the thermal couple will return the real uh, real time temperature, and the system will control pump one, pump three, and pump four to mix. Uh, hot, cold, and room temperature air to maintain the target temperature in the airbags. And this is an example for thermal air glove application. A user is bearing thermal air glove and touch a wooden box with a copper lid. So you can see uh, when touching these two different parts, and the temperature sensor is showing different changing levels for these two different parts. And we firstly technically evaluated temperature tracking performance for thermal air glove. Firstly, we measured different thermal parameters. And we assume the skin temperature is 13.4 degrees, which is neutral for most people. And then we set two directions of change, uh, warming and cooling, uh, two rates of change, one degree per second and two degree per second, and three intensities of change, two, four, and six degrees. 
So we totally test uh, two multiple two multiple three, uh, twelve different kinds of combination for thermal parameters, uh, which show which is showing in this table. And then we measure the step response of temperature change for different uh, 12 thermal stimuli. And we also include 34 degree as a neutral stimuli. So we totally, uh, so there were totally 13 stimuli. Uh, we also calculated the MAE, uh, mean absolute error, and MME for this 13 stimuli. And uh, the average MAE for propagational state is 0 0.37 degree. And the MAE for stable change is uh, 0 0.31 degree. So you can see the temperature signals could follow the theoretical trends. And then we adopt a simple infinity body model for our system to evaluate human skin contact, uh, human skin contact process for thermal based material simulation. And the semi infinity body model has been widely used in uh, material simulation in the real world objects. So we want to take this model as a reference for our system. And this formula shows the change of human skin temperature. Uh, TST is the uh, skin temperature change after contacting, and TSI and TOI are the initial skin temperature, uh, initial temperature of skin and materials. Uh, K, rho, and C are some uh, constants, uh, which are thermal conductivity, density, and the heat value values. Uh, RSO can be calculated with this constants. Uh, which is uh, thermal conduct contact res resistance. And then we adapted the thermal infinity body model on three kinds of different materials, copper, glass, and foam. We tried to fit the temperature of airbag surface with a theoretical model for the three different materials. And this is a simulate, this is a result of simulated copper. Uh, when the user is grasping the virtual spheres, the initial skin temperature is about uh, 13.4 degree. Uh, with a PID control, the thermal air glove system could reach the thermal equilibrium within two seconds from 13.4 degree to 28 degree and maintain the temperature from 26 to 27 degree in the following time. And for the te temperature, uh, for the result of simulated glass, uh, you can see the uh, average temperature change speed is about 1.78 degree per second uh, within the first two seconds. And this is a result of simulated, fo simulated foam. Uh, you, you can see uh, we could find there was no significant change for the contacting temperature. Well, this is a comparison result between the reference simulated results which is a dotted line, and the system simulated results, which is a solid line. From the figure, we can see the thermal air glass system, because uh, air glass system uh, simulated results could reach the similar changing trends and the final temperature uh, with the theoretical simulated results. And in addition, in order to quantitatively evaluate our system, we also calculated uh, MAE for every material in the temperature changing stage, which is uh, within two seconds after contacting and the following uh, stable stage. For more details, you can find our paper. Well, based on the temperature tracking performance evaluation, we conducted the first user perceptual experiment to measure participants' subjective thermal intensity. And this is the setup of our experiment. Participants were required to uh, give the perceived thermal intensity uh, by moving the slider. Uh, in a continuous scale from cold to hot. Uh, we collected the scores for 13 different thermal stimuli in temperature tracking experiments, and more details about experiment procedure could be found in our paper. Uh, the results show that the cooling sensation is more intensive than the warming sensation, and there is a, a significant difference in intensity of change between 2 degree and 6 degree and 2 degree and 4 degree. And the fast rate of change is significantly more intensive than the lower rate. And in addition, we performed uh, k-means clustering processing to classify 30 stimuli. Uh, the results showed our system could generate five distinguishable levels of stimuli from very cold to very warm. And 
A post hoc pairwise shows significant difference of thermal intensity rating between our clusters. And then we conducted another user perception experiment for materials identification among copper, glass, and foam. And the setup for this experiment was uh, similar with the previous user perception experiment. Well, uh, in this experiment, two types of material simulation, the real objects and the and the temperature signals of Tagalog were presented to the participants in two sequential sessions in a counterbalanced order. The results showed uh, our thermal air glove system could achieve the uh, average accuracy of 87.2%, uh, which could support users' material identification with, significant, with no significant difference compared to perceived real physical objects. And finally, we conducted user studies on um, their experience with thermal air glove. We compared three conditions of objects manipulation using bare hands without thermal air glove, denoted as bare hand. Wearing thermal air glove with room temperature air, but without any temperature and material simulation, denoted as Teglab F. And wearing thermal air glove with uh, thermal feedback and material simulation, denoted as Teglab TF. Well, the results show using thermal air glove in immersive VR could significantly improve users' experience of presence compared to uh, current commercial VR settings and thermal air glove system without any temperature or material simulation. Teglab F. Uh, lastly, in conclusion, we present thermal air glove, a pneumatic glove with embedded airbags, uh, which provides on hand control thermal feedback for users. A series of user perception experiments shows the Teglab system could provide five distinguishable levels of thermal sensation and thermal feedback to support users' material identification, which can improve immersive experience in VR. Uh, however, we also identified a few limitations in our current system. Uh, firstly, in thermal intensity rating parts, the system didn't cover all the range of thermal intensity rating. Uh, which means the participants didn't perceive extremely hot and cold sensations. Uh, this could be due to the heat transfer between the air in the tube and the environment during the air pumping, system, air pumping process. Uh, this could be solved with uh, better isolation in the future. And in addition, we mainly test three kinds of materials, copper, glass, and foam. This is because we follow the real material discrimination experiment as they have largely different from each other in terms of thermal properties. Well, in the future, we want to test more kinds of materials for discrimination in virtual environments. And lastly, our system mainly focuses on controlling the pneumatic thermal signals, but uh, there's no closed loop control mechanism for the air pressure feedback. Uh, actually, it is challenging to combine a uh, concurrent controlled force and thermal feedback in a single system. So, uh, in the future, we want to explore how to generate controlled force feedback based on current thermal air glove system. Okay, that's my presentation. Thank you for the listening. Feel free to give some comments. Thank you, Shayu, for a very interesting talk. Um, I don't see any questions on Slido, so if anyone has any questions, please post them on Slido so I can ask our speaker. Um, meanwhile, I'm curious to know what uh, the resolution of the system might be in the sense that right now your degree increments were whole numbers, right? One degree increments or two degree, and that was your rate of change. But can you go smaller, and especially if you have objects that have very small temperature differences, like glass and copper and foam have large variances in their temperatures. Um, so I'm wondering how would that system actually work when there's objects that are more similar, like foam and maybe wood would be closer or um, what the resolution might be? Yeah, thank you. That's a good question. 
Well, actually, uh, there are two important factors uh, which can depend on the uh, material identification. Uh, one is for temperature changing speed, and another is the final temperature. And uh, in my presentation, I mentioned that uh, for two materials, uh, there are uh, significantly uh, different uh, thermal properties uh, between these two materials, and human beings can, uh, can discriminate them in the real world objects. Uh, but as you know, in the real world, sometimes it's difficult to discriminate some um, uh, objects with similar thermal properties. For example, discriminate foam and wood, because when we touch them, we may feel there's no significant uh, uh, significant temperature change when we touch them one more one by one. So uh, for our current system, summer air club, we follow the uh, current experiment. Uh, we, we, we follow the current experiment uh, among the real physical objects. So in the future work, we want to explore, uh, uh, we, we want to explore that how the users can discriminate these uh, different materials in virtual environments uh, with thermal air glove. Okay, thanks. Um, I have a couple of questions on Slido. So I have a question from Park Dandu is asking, um, could you speculate as to why the bare hands condition was rated poorer? and the tackle of F condition, which was that? Uh, well, uh, as you know, uh, when you uh, grasping anything with a bare hand, uh, there's no uh, force feedback uh, or thermal feedback. Uh, as uh, when, uh, when you're grasping anything in VR, when, when you uh, feel force feedback, you may feel uh, something you are grasping, uh, which can improve the realness in virtual reality. So in our user study about the presence uh, experiment, uh, we uh, have the result about the thermal air glass system could perform better than bare hands. Oh, so at room temperature, you were still inflating the globe. It was just room temperature air, which means there was some feedback. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yes, but uh, only uh, room temperature, there's no uh, temperature change when the user is grasping anything. Uh, for example, when you're grasping two, uh, two cup of water, one cold water and one hot water, uh, there are very, very similar shapes, uh, object shapes. Uh, you cannot only uh, discriminate these two cups of water uh, with uh, uh, force feedback. So at this time, you may need to add the thermal feedback to uh, help you uh, discriminate these two different objects to improve the realness and immersive uh, sensations in virtual, rea you know, virtual reality. Okay, um, I have another question from Felipe Almeida. I was asking, in your study, you had color cues and the names of the materials. Did you do a study where the color is displayed, but the name of the material is not displayed? Uh, yes, uh, there are some uh, previous research that explores the uh, user's perception about a warm cooling, a warm cooling sensation, and they also calculate that the uh, warm warming sensation is more intensive than the cooling sensation. But in our system, we have the inverse results, and uh, we may calculate, uh, we may conclude that uh, our system is different with uh, this previous system because in the previous research, most researchers conduct these experiments with bacteria elements. As we know, bacteria elements is a uh, 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 as elements can change its uh, temperature with a high speed, uh, but the surface is magic. Maybe uh, the human beings, when they touch this uh, different material, uh, when they touch the surface of uh, surface about the uh, pietary elements, they may feel different sensations. Uh, but in the thermal air glove system, uh, our uh, touch uh, touch surface is a uh, uh, nylon uh, plastic. Uh, a nylon plastic with uh, a, uh, with uh, air uh, uh, our touch uh, our touch surface is airbags which made with nylon plastic. I think this totally different materials when you touch them in the uh, when, when, when you touch them because uh, so uh, maybe this is the reason why we conclude the different results compared with uh, previous research. Okay, thank you. Um, I hope that answers your second question, Felipe, about sensitivity to warm effects and to cold. It seems like in their work, cold was people were more sensitive to that than warm temperatures. Is that right? Right? Yeah. Uh, 
Um, okay, so there are no more questions. This brings us to the end of the session. I would like to thank all the speakers and all the attendees for participating. Um, I guess we can't really hear or clapping. So thank you very much for your talks. And before everybody takes off, I'd like to remind you the 3D UI session started about 15, 15 minutes ago and the research demos as well. So please, if you leave here, we encourage you to go over to hubs to experience these other parts of the conferences outside of the paper talks. Um, thank you once again, and everybody have a great evening. Bye.